Again, my name is Sean Wood. It is great to have all of you here. And uh, welcome to the very first service of Freedom Church. We're so excited that you're here. Yeah. I'll tell you just in one sentence why we're here is because we believe with our whole hearts that Jesus has changed our lives and we want to share with everyone that we can in Monk's Corner and Goose Creek and Somerville and quite honestly from wherever people would drive is that Jesus changed our lives and we pray that he can change yours and your friends and your families as well. We believe in it. We know he did it and that's why we're here. We believe in the freedom Amen. that he gives us. And so we're excited to be here. Hey, I want to tell you, I was, uh, I was traveling back home. Uh, from a speaking engagement in the upstate of South Carolina. And so I was, you know, four hours away or so, um, and I was actually had been speaking at the Clemson FCA. Those of you who are Clemson grads, it's a great, great FCA there, one of, the, one of the best FCAs in the country. It's amazing. Been speaking at Clemson FCA and was traveling back and um, decided I'd been away for a whole night, and so I decided to call back home just to check in with my wife, and, and at that time, just my little girl, Isabel, who was about two and a half years old. She was our only child at that time. And so um, I called back. It was about uh, right after lunchtime, in between lunchtime and when nap time would be coming up. So I was just going to check in, tell Isabel, love her, tell her good night, I mean, uh, good, good nap, because I didn't get to see her the night before and everything. So I called. And now, for those of you who are parents, you know there are two types of calls that get received um, by parents. There's one type of call where it's just everything's going good. It's smooth. The phone is answered in the right amount of rings. It's, hey, how are you doing? What's up? You know, th th things are going well. Everybody is getting along. The house is in order. No one's tried to, like, take over the house today. Everything is good. You know that as parents. And then there's another kind of call that you get as a parent when you call your spouse. And that is one that I got this day. So I, I called back. It was a lot more rings than normal for Connie. She answered the phone usually pretty, pretty promptly if it's near her, but it's a lot more rings. And then when she answered the phone, the only way I really know how to describe it is that it sounded like Connie was wrestling with a mule at the same time as trying to answer the phone. Have you had one of those before where there's like, then things are popping around. I can tell she's kind of walking. Just a minute, Sean. And then I hear this. She, Isabel, no, don't touch it. Sean, just a minute. And I'm like, well, what in the world is going on? And then I hear again, Isabel, do not touch it. And I can tell by the way that Connie's breathing and moving that she's kind of moving fast towards a parenting crisis, okay? You guys have parenting crises before? You know what those are. So she's moving towards this parenting crisis and she's fumbling around the phone. I hear, no, Isabel, don't touch it. Do not touch it. One more time. And then, in the faintest voice, my little princess, who dresses up almost every day. I came home yesterday, she was Belle, all decked out in Belle. She's five and a half now. Came home yesterday, but during this time, she dresses like a princess. She has tea parties. She holds her pinky out like Pink Alicious when she drinks tea because that's more fancy. You guys know Pink Alicious, more fancy. So she does all this, but I hear in the faintest little voice in the background, but mommy, I want to touch the poop. <laughs> that's what I hear. And so I hear, Sean, just a minute, don't touch it. But mommy, I want to touch the poop. I want to touch the poop, I hear her proclaim. And I'm going, what in the world is going on? What are we talking about? And then this is what I get. And I, I love these. Don't you? This, I get these every now and then. Connie's awesome at not doing this most of the time. But then I get, I'll call you back later, bye. And it's gone. Like, radio <laughs> silence, nothing else. And I'm going, who's poop? <laughs> talking about whose poop is she touching it, where are we at that we're touching poop why are we wanting to touch poop i got no story to tell and so i am driving back hands free for those of you who are wondering i'm driving back from greenville area and i'm going what in the world and i know she'll eventually call me back i'm dying to call but i know if i call now i've, I've been told i'll call you back later <laughs> That says, I'll call you back later. And so I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm anticipating this story. And I know nap time is coming. So nap time comes and I get the call back and I say, what in the world happened? What was going on? And so Connie tells me the whole story. So here's what had happened. I had been away for a night. We had at that time a little miniature dachshund. And she liked to go poop in the backyard as many of your dogs like to. And theoretically, if I had been there, I would have cleaned it up. Theoretically, if I'd been there, I'd have cleaned up. But definitely, since I wasn't there, I had not been there to clean up. And so there was, just to not do graphic, a fresh offering uh, for Isabel to be intrigued by. Now, what I have to tell you is, in our backyard, 
there is a playset that someone gave us. It's one of those wooden playsets that have like a couple of levels, big slide that comes down. There is a couple of swings. One of the swing areas is with this little deal that you can swing back and forth on like a gymnastics person. I mean, it's amazing playset. There's a boat thing that you can drive up in the top that we're, I mean, just blessed with it. And that's in our backyard. Okay, where, where, where does welcome play? And then there is to compete with that a fresh offering. <laughs> All right, so that's the two choices that the two and a half year old has. And this day, in this moment, she was drawn to, nay, I would say, pulled in by to touch the poop. And I ask myself, because I ask myself weird questions, do I ever want to touch the poop? I mean, really, I. Do I ever walk through the yard and go home? Wonder what that's about. You know, wonder, what, wonder what's going on there. And then I asked because I thought about you guys, and, and, and I thought, do they ever want to touch the food? I mean, do you ever walk through and want to? We would say, no, that's a two and a half year old problem, child. We, we kind of got past that at some point. But here's what I would say is I think that probably some of us actually do. That probably if we were to be really honest with ourselves, we would say, yeah, we do. What if I define it like this? What if I said we were to find this as something gross and disgusting in our lives? And what if we were to find something gross and disgusting as anything outside of the will of God for your life? Anything that was outside of what God wants for your life is gross and disgusting. And then what if we took this little SAT logic question out and said, well, what if we were to find anything outside of the will of God as a word? that we've heard a lot that maybe don't apply to our own lives a whole bunch of sin. Now I have to answer. I know I'm drawn to sin in my life. I know I'm drawn to touch the things in my life that God has called off limits. I know I'm drawn when there is this unbelievable life that God wants for me. It's like a double-decker, wooden, playset life where I can go down the slides of joy, where I can experience it in the swings of life that He brings into my way, where I can have community with you guys and, I, and to have this available in my yard I have this available in my life and then oftentimes in the deep dark places of my heart I know I am drawn to the sin that so easily entangles us the Bible says see now let me ask you that question again do you ever want to touch the poop is there a sin in your life that just eats your lunch I and mean, you've tried to shake it, but the truth is, is you're being destroyed by it. You find yourself even maybe here this weekend because you're just looking for some hope. You see, this world, in fact, is full of great examples of people who desperately want to touch the things in our lives that God has called off limits. There's the men who are here right now at church. Maybe you come to church every weekend, or maybe this is the first time in a while but you won't want to, but before today is over, you will look at inappropriate things on the internet. Sin. It's the woman who, it started out as just a message from a guy she went to high school on Facebook. And then it got kind of cute, and there was no harm in it really, but then it developed, and it developed, and the truth is, as you sit here, you know, you know that it's crossed a line, but you're intrigued. Your life is great. You have a good husband, or maybe you don't have a good husband, but you're drawn to it. It's the young engaged couple who vowed to stop having sex and to stop living a life and pretending that they're married, and they vowed to do it. They want to do it. They deep in their heart they want to do it, and yet they're drawn to the sin. See, we're all drawn to sin in our lives. We don't really even know why, except that there's this deep calling in our lives like a two and a half year old who walks through her backyard and chooses to touch something gross and disgusting when there is an unbelievable life of freedom available. And it's just like the pastor who has spoken a few examples with ease but has his own stuff to deal with. And his own places in his heart that he is daily capturing because sin happens. Everyone in here finds ourselves in some level of difficulty and hardship in life. 
pain from someone who has hurt us, pain from a relationship that's gone sour, pain from a family member's sickness or a family member's death, pain from a sin maybe that we have committed and we've brought our own pain into our life, but nonetheless, the pain is still the same. But the scary thing is, is that most of us in this room this weekend, have not spent the time to deal with that sin in our lives, the only way that will do any good, and that is to think on our eternity, not the now, and not how do we handle the now, but of our eternity. Jesus had this happen. In fact, Jesus was talking to a crowd about the size of this, probably in a very similar town as Mutt's Corner, size of Mutt's Corner, or Goose Creek, and he was talking to this crowd and he said this to them. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 12. If you don't, it'll be up on the screen and that's fine. Luke chapter 12. Jesus talks to this crowd in this very small town of this crowd of people about the size that we've got right here. He said also to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing in, you say there's going to be a scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, Jesus said. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the, interpret the present time? This is a great story from Jesus. I love what Jesus is saying. Because it's so much like our world today. And it's so much like each and every one of us in here. Because I guess people really haven't changed that much in all these years. Jesus says, the people here are far too concerned with the weather. He says they're, they're talking about the weather. How many of you even this morning have said something about the weather? Have you, have you talked about the weather at all this morning? Maybe you commented to your spouse when you were coming in, boy, it's going to be a hot one, or I hope it sure doesn't rain today, or I saw on the news it's going to be some thunderstorms this afternoon. Here's what I've learned. I, I got my wife an iPhone recently. And on the iPhone, there are all these apps that are amazing. They can just like do amazing things. And, and you have to download them. You have to go and download the apps to get them. And there's an app store where you can go and get some free ones and you can buy some and all that kind of stuff. Here's what I noticed about our iPhone. It's on the iPhone, the weather app is already on there. Because they know we want to know about the weather. We want to know what's going on. Why? Because we want to prepare for the future. And what Jesus is saying here is you have taken the time to know whether it's going to be hot next Thursday, to know whether it's going to rain this afternoon, but ironically, you haven't taken the time to worry about forever. And he says, you know what, next Thursday, it's going to be hot, but it's a lot hotter in hell. Because it's ironic, isn't it? I mean, we have taken the time to figure out next Thursday, but we have no idea what's going to happen in our eternity. He says, are you going to heaven or hell? You don't know. You haven't really thought about it. It's real. And although we are sucked into thinking we can control our lives, if we just know how the weather is going to be, if we can just watch the stock market enough, if we can see it go up and down and up and down and our IRAs float away and our 401ks go away, we can watch all of that stuff and we see it happening and we think if we can just put stuff on our calendar, if we can just check off our to-do list, if we can just control the people in our lives just enough and if we can just know what the weather is going to be like. And we've got it all under control. What Jesus is saying is, He's reminding us that we tend to prepare for the seasons and pick out our next wardrobe choice more than forever. And forever is a long time. Forever is a very long time. He continues on in this story. He says, and why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. Jesus continues by saying, if you're going to get prepared for the weather, you should really get prepared for the judgment. Whether it's hot or cold, Tomorrow is not nearly as significant as whether you know how you're going to spend eternity. And he uses this interesting parable or analogy. Let me apply it to you personally and to me personally. What if you had committed this unbelievable crime? For some of you, this is not too hard to imagine. That was funny. You're supposed to laugh. That's okay. If I did another service, I wouldn't use that joke next time. But for some of you, it's not too hard to imagine. But what if you committed this unbelievable crime? And here's the deal. It was atrocious crime. You knew you were guilty. 
You knew you were guilty. Everyone knew you were guilty. The evidence was incontrovertible. I mean, it, everyone knew you were going to have to be punished. Everybody knew it. You knew it. That's all it was. You went to a lawyer. You said, I'm going to hire a lawyer and see what I can do. And you go to the lawyer and he looks at all the case and he says, I just need to tell you, you need to prepare yourself for sentencing because there is absolutely nothing that I can do. You're guilty. You know you're guilty. Just prepare yourself. And so days start to get restless and nights start to get sleepless as you imagine what's going to happen. And you imagine what awaits you at the sentencing. And so you're, you're thinking through this. You're worrying through this. You're anxious. And then as the day approaches, you get a letter in the mail. And you see on this letter in the mail that there is... On the top left hand corner, the address of that one that you hurt. The one you committed the crime about, and your stomach just kind of sinks. Because you go, oh no, this is just, it's just going to rub it in, it's going to remind me of how I hurt him, just going to remind me of the sentencing. But you open up the letter even against your own best judgment. And when you open the letter, you see the first words, and it takes your breath away. It says, I love you. And I want to tell you, I've been thinking about you a lot. And you heard me, and I, I, we can't look past that. But I want you to know that I want to be there for you. And although you hurt me, I, I know that your family is probably turning against you. I know that everyone that you love is probably turning against you. And I know that you are in a deep, dark place. But I want you to know that I'm here for you. And then also I want to let you know this. I want to let you off the hook. I'm going to go before the judge and I want you to come with me. Just meet with me. I want to forgive you and then I want to go to the judge and I want to tell him that I'm not pressing any charges. I'm letting everything go. I'm not, I'm not holding anything against you. It's all done. It's all accounted for. Just come and meet with me, he says. And as you read this letter, your, your breath is taken away because you can't believe it. Just moments later, you knew you were going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Or even worse, you were going to be put to death for this atrocious crime. And as you saw this, in one instant, your life completely changed. Because your accuser, the victim of your crime, says, I'm going to let you off the hook. And all he says is, will you meet with me? <coughs> Come meet with me and let's talk this over. And we're going to settle this thing. What Jesus is saying is, wow, you're on the way. Meet with your accuser. And, and Jesus is paying the sense of urgency that needs to be seen. And then, so I imagine if you read that letter, you're going to get up. You're going to run to the phone. You're going to call this person. You're going to say, hey, when can we meet? Can we meet right now? I'll bring something in writing. Let's get something signed. I'll run to your house. There's going to be a level of urgency to deal with this matter as soon as possible. And what Jesus is saying is, you got this letter. In scripture, it tells the story of the greatest love story ever. That all of us, me, the worst of sinners, was guilty as the same goes as sin. And because of that, there was nothing that I could do. But my victim of my crime has written me a letter called the Bible. And he says, I am going to let you off the hook. All you have to do is come meet with me. And yet Jesus is saying... Isn't it amazing that even within this, the urgency is not there? Jesus is compelling us toward a sense of urgency. And some of us in this room, quite frankly, do not have that sense of urgency. We don't realize that there is a gift of freedom. You're a prisoner and you don't even realize it. You're in chains and you don't even realize it. And there is someone who's saying, I will set you free. And yet we sit back and we say, I wonder what the weather is going to be like. Tomorrow, but we're not thinking about forever. And what I would tell you is do not delay. We did all of this. We prepared everything that we had prepared so that we could have you here today to say don't delay anymore. Don't let your life be eaten up by sin anymore. Don't let guilt live inside of you anymore. Don't let the prospect of your future depress you anymore. Don't let the enemy convince you that you've done too much to stand before Jesus and for him to be able to forgive you anymore. Don't let people convince you that just because you showed up to church every now and then and just because your grandmother was a really good saint that you don't need to do anything about it. Don't let this world convince you that you've got another day because for some of us in a crowd this size, there'll be tragedy. 
You've seen it in your own life. He says there's an urgency. And the reason there's an urgency is because there's two types of people. There's bad people and there's God. And each and every one of us are bad because you're not God. And if you think you are, just lean to your spouse or your friend who's with you and ask them, am I God? If that won't you just turn to your neighbor and say, you one bad fellow or you one bad woman. You can do it. Talk, talk. It's good. You one bad fellow, you one bad woman. And that's not like the 80s bad, you know. I'm bad, I'm bad. You know what, chum on. That's not what we're talking about. Don't about bad, we're bad. Because we're not God. I'm bad. Just like me, you have sin that needs to be dealt with. But we put it in the back of our minds and we don't deal with it. The second thing I know is you and I cannot do anything to change this. There's nothing we can do. And some of you have tried. You've tried to tighten up. You've tried to get better. You've tried to do good stuff. You've tried to be a better man or a better woman. You've tried to not do the things that it so easily entangles you anymore. And you have tried and you have tried and you have tried and you have repeatedly over your life failed. Because you're guilty. And you can't do anything about it. You can't earn your way back into God's favor. And the scripture, like a lawyer, points to the truth for us and says, you just need to prepare for your sins. But here's the good news. Here's the great news. Jesus died to take care of your sin. He's written you that love letter and said, I want to take care of it for you. And you can do that today. My only question to you would be, what are you waiting for? For some of you, you've sat through this message before. For some of you, you've come to church for many years and you've thought, one day I'll get to it. One day I will allow Jesus to save me and it will change my life. I ask, what are you waiting for? You see, here's the deal. Some of you say, well, what if you're wrong, Sean? What if everything you're pouring your life into is wrong? I have nothing to lose. If I'm wrong, I have nothing to lose. I'll be a better man because of it. I will be transformed because of it. And the community will be better for it. I have nothing to lose. If you're wrong, you have everything to lose. If you're wrong, not only do you have your abundant life that you can have right now, that playground in your backyard, you have eternity on the line. So why would you put this off another day? Why would you put your spouse, who maybe is a believer, through this another day where they worry, will he wake up in the morning? Because I know if he doesn't, he doesn't know where he's going to spend eternity because Jesus is not there to save him. But we're prepared for you today. Just for you. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. And when I do, if you want to pray to take that next step with Jesus, you can pray it with me. And then what we want to do for you is offer you even another step that you can take. We want to give you the opportunity to be baptized today. See, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward change. And I know some of you are thinking right now, I'm not getting in a pool with jeans on. I'm just not going to do it or khakis or whatever it is. Well, we've, we've thought about you. We've prepared for you. We've bought shorts in every single size. We have bought shirts in every single size. We've got hair gel. We've got hair dryers. We have got everything you could possibly imagine. We even have unmentionables for you if you need it. Because we love you. And we want you to do this step. Take this step today. So we're going to give you a chance in just a moment after I pray. We're going to begin singing. And during that time, I would ask that if you had made this choice today and you want to be baptized, that you go back to the back corner where the light is here. There's some people who love you, who want to take care of you, and we'll do that for you. We had a feeling that you would come, and we've been preparing for you. So what are you waiting for? Why would you wait another day? Why would you worry more about next week's weather than your eternity and that Jesus wants to see? Jesus died. He rose from the grave so that you don't have to face another day with uncertainty. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for each man and woman and child represented here, each family that's here. God, I thank you that they have come boldly and stepped into a church, maybe for some, for the first time in a long time. God, I am convinced that you drew them here, that you wanted them to be here, God. 
And I'm convinced that today their life is going to be changed. Father, I love you. And I thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. And God, boldly, we come to you. We ask that you would do this. If you know this song, sing it with me. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Father, I thank you so much for those that prayed this prayer with me, God. They're going to pray with me now. Father, I love you. I ask you to save me, God. I can do nothing. I can do nothing to be saved. But God, you died on the cross for me. And so today, a day I never expected to be like today, God, I step towards you. And in that one step, you do all the rest of the work, God, in saving me. God, I pray that you would save me in Jesus' name. That you would cover all of my sin. And that you would transform me from within. And now, God, I take the bold step of showing the world that I love you by being baptized today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.